Um, so again, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's fireside chat. These chats were something we began at the sort of first, uh, you know, during during the COVID period as a way of connecting our scholars with our other audiences at the library company and of hearing about the work that's going on, a way of replacing some of the conversations that we were have used to have in the reading room. The reading room is open again on a limited basis and we're starting to see scholars again, but these talks have provided a really great out, outlet for uh, people to talk about new scholarship and for our community to learn about the latest and best about what's going on out there in the world. Um, tonight, I'm really, really pleased to have Professor Teresa Gadu from Vanderbilt University with us. Um, she is going to be talking about her new book, or new-ish book anyway. Um, uh, but before we get into her book, I just want to give you um, just a, her quick bio. The title of the book, of course, is Selling Anti-Slavery. My, my brain skipped a neuron there. Um, but Professor Gadu is Professor of English and American Studies at Vanderbilt, where she also serves as the faculty head of E. Bronson Ingram College. A specialist in 19th century American literature and culture, her research focuses on slavery and anti-slavery, race and American culture, the history of the book, genre studies, as well as print material and visual culture. She is the author of Gothic America, Narrative, History and Nation, published by Columbia University Press. And more recently, and we'll be talking about it tonight, Selling Anti-Slavery, Abolition and Mass Media in Antebellum America which is coming up from UPenn Press. She is the recipient of two grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, a Mellon Foundation Sawyer Seminar, and a Senior Specialist Fulbright Award. Um, we are really glad to have her here for tonight's fireside chat. Um, Teresa, if you don't mind, I'm going to hand it right back over to you. Thank you so much, Mike. And many thanks to the library company for inviting me to share insights and objects from my recently published book, and especially to Blanche for organizing tonight's talk and Mike for hosting it. And I wanna thank you, the audience, for taking the time at the end of what I'm sure was a long day to be here. My book began with a month long fellowship at the library company to explore its archives. The richness of the library company's materials was matched only by the knowledge and helpfulness of its staff, as well as the collegiality of fellow researchers. I also wanna note how welcoming and accommodating uh, the library company was to me. At the time, I had two young children and um, the institution allowed me to break up my fellowship in such a way as to maximize the length of time, to minimize the length of time that I was away from home at any given juncture. And I deeply appreciate how the library company was flexible in addressing not just my academic, but also my personal needs. Of the 15 plus physical archives I visited to write this book, not to mention the numerous digital archives, the foundational research I did at the library company remains the most crucial um, to my conceptualization of the book. And I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to publicly thank them here. So my plan today is to provide an overview of my book, Selling Anti-Slavery, Abolition and Mass Media in Antebellum America, which um, as Mike said, has been published by UPenn Press in their material text series. By providing a sense of its key arguments and objects before turning to a close reading of one particular object, the coin box that graces its cover. I'm happy to discuss any of the objects that will soon flit across your screen more during the question and answer period. I wanna make one note about the American Anti-Slavery Society before I get started. It was established in 1833 and split into two, two distinct parts in 1840. The American Anti-Slavery Society, which was taken over by Garrison and headquartered in Boston, and the American and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society, which remained in the hands of the Tappan Brothers and was headquartered in New York City. The distinct quasi-corporate enterprise of the 1830s that I discuss in this talk often falls out of view in favor of understanding the American Anti-Slavery Society as one continuous organization, which it was most certainly not. When we read the American Anti-Slavery Society's distinct pre and post 1840 organizational configurations as continuous 
or tell its history through a single individual, most often garrison. We lose sight of how instrumental the 1830s American Anti-Slavery Society was to the causes eventual success. The 1830s American Anti-Slavery Society, I argue, established the conditions that would motor the anti-slavery machine through the antebellum era. I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay, hey, Selling Anti-Slavery seeks to understand how the social injustice of slavery was pushed into public consciousness by the anti-slavery movement in the antebellum era. It accomplishes this by analyzing the massive media archive that the American Anti-Slavery Society deployed to popularize its message, printed material and visual items, and in so doing shows how culture can help to create social change. Through its multimedia propaganda, the American Anti-Slavery Society transformed a marginalized cause into a mass social movement that helped to end slavery. My aim for this book was to survey the whole of anti-slavery media, a field that is often read through a single iconic text, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. What more might we learn if we understood Uncle Tom's Cabin to be the apex rather than the birth of anti-slavery mass media. If we saw it and all the items it spun off, wallpaper, dolls, games, tea sets, as the breakthrough forms of a much longer history. Hence, I set out to write the prehistory of Uncle Tom's Cabin. The book begins with an institutional history of the American Anti-Slavery Society as a media, not just reform enterprise. By piecing together information from the society's annual reports and meeting minutes, I detail how anti-slavery built and ran its media machine. Headquartered in New York City in the 1830s, the American Anti-Slavery Society created a managerially directed, centralized structure that resembled a modern business enterprise. Vertically arranged with state and local auxiliary chapters nestled within a federated structure, and run by the society's executive committee, the American Anti-Slavery Society operated like a franchise system with, auxil with, each auxiliary part, with each auxiliary part of and taking direction from a centralized management structure. The American Anti-Slavery Society's paid staff of professional managers, many of them drawn from other reform movements or business, hired and trained agents plan national legislative action, organize petition campaigns, raise money, and produce publications. The executive committee's top-down mode of managing produced a systemized structure of interlinked societies in the 1830s that worked in concert towards similar ends. Specifically, the American Anti-Slavery Society's visible hand of management was evident in its production of media. Located in the leading center of antebellum manufacturing and printing, New York City, the executive committee embraced new technologies such as stereotyping and the steam press to produce massive amounts of cheap print. It contracted with printers, bookbinders, and stereotypers, purchased plates, negotiated copyrights, wrote or edited many works, coordinated publication schedules, and devised dissemination networks. Its organizational infrastructure, along with its innovative publishing strategies, allow the American Anti-Slavery Society to mobilize its message at a national scale. The American Anti-Slavery Society circulated over a million copies of its publications yearly in the late 1830s. The foundational text of the American Anti-Slavery Society as media enterprise was its catalog of publications of anti-slavery works for sale at its offices and depositories, published here in the Emancipator, the American Anti-Slavery Society's official organ. This catalog both names and shapes the institutional forms and practices of the American Anti-Slavery Society by articulating the publishing techniques, discursive, material, distributional, 
that enabled the American Anti-Slavery Society to, to become one of the first producers of mass media in the antebellum era. Titled Catalog of Books and Pamphlets on the Subject of Slavery and Abolition, it advertises an array of print material and visual items. Everything from periodicals and pamphlets to letter paper and handkerchiefs, as well as engravings and broadsides. Published regularly in the periodical organs, volumes, and reports of the American Anti Slavery Society, the catalog collects the extensive print, material, and visual culture that the US anti slavery movement produced between the establishment of the American Anti Slavery Society in the early 1830s and the collapse of its centralized quasi corporate model in 1840. In capturing the astonishing variety of forms and formats, through which the anti-slavery movement made its appeal. The catalog encapsulates the movement's multiple modes of address, both discursive and material. First, it provides an overview of the diverse rhetorical and generic modes that the American Anti-Slavery Society employed to craft its message for specific audiences. Anti-slavery made its appeal through apologies, inquiries, observations, testimonies, debates, and sermons, as well as narratives, letters, lectures, poetry, and pictures. The catalog contains texts addressed specifically to children, Christian women, Northern men, free colored Americans, slaveholders, and the Southern clergy, among others. It further includes genres design, designed for different readers, erudite periodicals for intellectuals, almanacs for working men, gift books for parlor readers. And juvenile tracts for children. By speaking in multiple idioms through assorted genres, the American Anti Slavery Society created a malleable message for its era's proliferating publics. Second, the catalog highlights the different material forms the American Anti Slavery Society utilized to package its message. It classifies its entries under the headings of bound volumes, pamphlets, tracts, as well as prints and etc. It presents printed texts as well as images and objects fully elaborated arguments in bound volumes, as well as brief discussions in cheaper, more portable forms. Within categories or singular forms, texts are also produced in, a, in different material versions. Tracks are listed in both regular and miniature sizes, suitable for the vest pocket. The Society's Declaration of Sentiments is available as a cheap two-penny tract, as well as a more expensive 50-cent print reproduced on satin and suitable for framing. Lydia Maria Child's The Fountain, a collection of passages and scripture for every day of the year is offered in both plain and gilt binding. The American Anti-Slavery Society's assorted packaging enabled it to differentiate its products purposes as well as their price points. The quarterly anti-slavery magazine's hefty material form, its two volumes bound as one, sold, selling for $1.75, bespoke the seriousness of its message to a highbrow moneyed audience. Conversely, the small size of the children's periodical, The Slave's Friend, which was illustrated with pictures and sold for 25 cents, reflected its audience's diminutive physical size nascent literacy and limited funds. By differentiating its products formats and pricing, the American Anti-Slavery Society was able to materialize its media's meaning for an increasingly segment, segmented audience and meet the purchasing power of a wide range of buyers. Anti-slavery media, as the catalog makes clear, operated both as persuasive arguments speaking through antebellum's core discourses and as material commodities, 
packaged for an emerging consumer market. Third, in addition to form and format, the catalog also signals the society's modes and range of distribution. Advertising its works as for sale at the office of the American Anti-Slavery Society, number 143 Nassau Street, New York. The catalog shows how anti-slavery offices also served as media depositories and in many cases, reading rooms. As the American Anti-Slavery Society's auxiliaries grew, so too did its supply network. Enlisting each text price per single, dozen, and hundred, the catalog announces the extensive dissemination the American Anti-Slavery Society expected for its products. By designing policies that encourage the diffusion of its publications, such as stereotyping its works, supplying tracks gratuitously, or offering discounts for those buying in bulk, the American Anti-Slavery Society created the conditions for general supply. The please read and circulate instruction on the front cover of many American Anti-Slavery Society publications underscores how the anti-slavery movement pr promoted a general and extensive circulation for its works. Moreover, as an advertisement, located in the back pages of the Emancipator or the Liberator and repeated weekly, the catalog exemplifies the innovative and consolidating marketing strategies that the American Anti-Slavery Society used to sell its products. Published in a wide array of anti-slavery texts, the catalog turns each individual text into an advertisement for all others. Through capitalizing on new technologies of reproduction and publicity, as well as new modes of consumerism and organization to broaden and disseminate its appeal, the American Anti-Slavery Society created a national mass market for its cultural productions before one existed in the mainstream. The catalog foregrounds several of the book's main argument. First, how the American Anti-Slavery Society utilized not just print, but also material and visual media to construct its message. Second, how it correlated form to format to market its media. And third, how it consolidated its proliferating publications under a single institutional identity, thereby coalescing its assorted appeals into a single unified voice. The American Anti-Slavery Society's institutional structure created mechanisms for mobilizing anti-slavery media on a mass scale, while its persuasive popular media forms generated interest in and won converts to the cause. Each propelled the other. The American Anti-Slavery Society drove the rise of mass media in the 1830s, and that media in turn facilitated the spread of anti-slavery reform. A media powerhouse, the American Anti-Slavery Society manufactured abolition as a compelling brand in the 1830s and beyond. Following the structure of the catalog, I divide my own book into three parts, anti-slavery print, material and visual culture. Even as the book as a whole works to show how these media modes overlap and inform each other. The first part surveys anti-slavery print culture. It focuses on the discourse of fact to show how institutional anti-slavery use new modes of evidence to render slavery visible and present its own knowledge system as credible. In delineating how the cause collected and diffused information through a coordinated print system, this section foregrounds the American Anti-Slavery Society's rational appeal to the head. It investigates two genres that lay at the heart of the American Anti-Slavery Society's print system, the almanac and the slave narrative. Let me first say a little bit about the almanac. As the informational genre of its day, the Almanac allowed anti-slavery advocates to leverage the power of data to solidify slavery as a social fact and thus frame it as a social problem. Like the Almanac's other cosmologies, its tide or astrological charts, 
slavery becomes a sign system to be decoded and understood. By integrating its data within the Almanac's other knowledge systems, historical and political, as well as natural, and conventionalized format, it was to be consulted daily. The anti-slavery movement produced anti-slavery knowledge in a legible and familiar form, wedded its novel perspective to other culturally acceptable truths, and transformed its facts into household knowledge. The early slave narrative was similarly constructed as a factual compendium. The enslaved person's eyewitness accounts were key to the American Anti-Slavery Society's collection of facts. Compiled with white authored evidence, the early slave narrative was made to accord with already produced anti-slavery information, especially their use of the runaway slave advertisement. Sorry, I lost my place. In telling the institutional origin story of the antebellum slave narrative, I show how slave testimony came to be regulated through white empiricism. The American Anti-Slavery Society's knowledge system, which embraced similarity over difference and subordinated formerly enslaved people's narratives to the imperatives of facticity, had long lasting effects on the genre. Part two examines the material artifacts, domestic objects, and gift books that the American Anti-Slavery Society's female auxiliaries created for their fashionable Christmas time fairs. Running from the 1830s through the late 1860s and operating as a key fundraiser, the fairs show how an army of women workers use consumer culture to sell anti-slavery as an exemplar of sociability refinement, and good taste. The fairs marked anti-slavery as middle class, creating cultural as well as commercial capital. Speaking objects sold at fairs, domestic goods emblazoned with anti-slavery mottos, such as this pin cushion, they also had potholders and a large array of speaking objects, harnessed middle class commodity culture to the cause, while foreign and fashionable items created a culture of class. The fair's tasteful objects, such as gift books made especially for the fair, served as status markers. To be middle class was to be anti-slavery, these gilded edge books embossed with the Liberty Bell proclaimed. This section examines the discourses of sentiment and refinement that made up anti-slavery's appeal to the heart and shows how abolitionist mass media shaped the narratives that form Northern white middle-class identity, thereby converting that class to anti-slavery. Fairs and their objects both catered to and developed middle-class taste and attached that class consciousness to anti-slavery. By reading fairs as symbolic spaces that constructed cultural, cultured as well as consuming subjects, I show how anti-slavery came to be associated with and interior, interiorized by the middle class. Part three analyzes the American Anti-Slavery Society's extensive visual culture. It circulated 40,000 images a year in the form of broadsides as well as illustrated tracks and objects. And in particular, this section focuses on um, the Anti-Slavery Society's use of the mass visual medium of the panorama. Through panoramic landscape pictures and broadsides that resembled miniature panoramas, the American Anti-Slavery Society detailed slavery's cruel operations and visualized the North's superiority over the South. For white Northern viewers, the anti-slavery panorama communicated a message of Northern nationalism and political power. This section examines the American Anti-Slavery Society's appeal to the eye, showing how the movement's panoramic pictures, specifically their commanding perspective, catalyzed not just regionalized, but also racialized points of view. Here I build on longstanding arguments about how anti-slavery iconogra iconography 
especially its image of the kneeling slave, encoded racial hierarchy by visualizing the liberation of subjugated black bodies by benevolent white subjects and depicting the viewer's dominance over not just the South, but also the slave. I show how the American Anti-Slavery Society pictured not just Northern, but white supremacy through its images, aerial viewpoints and scopic sovereignty. In crystallizing class consciousness as racial superiority, anti-slavery produced the Northern middle class as white. In this section, I also push back against institutional anti-slavery's racialized codes of seeing by detailing how black activists created a counter visuality, one that asserted their right to look. Reading the slave narrative as well as large scale black panoramas, I show how black activists utilized a fugitive perspective to portray black people as agents of their own emancipation. Through word and image, African-American activists painted panoramas of slavery that also envisioned black freedom. The final chapter details their adaptations of the American Anti-Slavery Society's visual iconography, revealing how black cultural producers asserted their own points of view and expanded the American Anti-Slavery Society's visual lexicon by supplementing the suffering slave with the resistant runaway and establishing their own iconic aerial visual vantage point, the North Star. I'm having such a hard time advancing, thank you. In black activists' panoramic pictures, the enslaved envision and claim their own emancipation. Throughout the book, I foreground race as a crucial if often neglected aspect of media archeology span and demonstrate how institutional anti-slavery expanded the field of black media, the slave narrative, for instance, even as it shaped and often limited the contours of that field. The conclusion discusses the American Anti-Slavery Society's third decade celebration held in 1863 after emancipation was proclaimed to reflect on the ends of anti-slavery mass media and the durability of institutional anti-slavery's cultural project, arguing that the anti-slavery society's media narrative prioritized emancipation over equality. Let me end by anchoring this broad overview of my book and a very specific reading um, of an anti-slavery coin box that telescopes the book's larger arguments. Created to accompany the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society's weekly contribution plan, which raised money for the cause by collecting small donations at regular weekly intervals. The coin box functioned not only as a treasury, but also as a tract and a domestic material object. Issued as an addition for six and a quarter cents or 75 cents for a dozen, the box was described as a use as useful as a tract as it is convenient as a treasury. Covered with appropriate devices and inscriptions on every side as well as the top, it rhetorically speaks of sympathy for the enslaved. The front image of the kneeling slave framed by rays of light which melt the chains on the Corinthian columns in the foreground promises her release if contributors will only answer the kneeling woman's prayer and drop a coin into the top of the box directly above her imploring eyes. Located in the heavens and sanctified by the biblical injunctions that frame the deposit slot and speak of transforming faith into good works, the donations assume God's moral authority and power to lift the oppressed. Maria Weston Chapman's poem, A Sabbath Morning Hymn, printed on one side of the box, further consecrates each contribution as a gift of freedom. The biblical injunctions on the other side remind readers of their duty to deliver the enslaved and show her mercy and compassion. The back, which lays out the objective, objectives of the weekly contribution plan, along with step-by-step -step directions for conducting it, ties the sympathy for the slave 
to anti-slavery organization. The front image generates sympathy for the oppressed. The poetic hymn and quotations from scripture on the sides and top increase that sympathy and tied explicitly to religious duty. And the back explains how good works for the enslaved are best performed through systematic donations to the anti-slavery cause. The book's coordinated message teaches contr contributors to turn their sympathy into sense. By gathering coins, abstract feeling becomes concrete action and sympathy is made to speak. The box function as a decorative domestic material object further mobilizes this affective circuit. Designed to be placed on a chimney mantle or table in the most public room of the house, the box reflects the ideals of middle-class domesticity, especially those of piety and compassion. Located in and physically over the hearth of the home, it augments the ideals of benevolence that surround it. Visually, its burning rays of truth extend the warming light of the domestic hearth upward, tur turning the parlor mantle into an altar of freedom. As a religious shrine, quote unquote, a little treasury of the Lord, whose ritual donation occurred every Sabbath morning, the box sanctifies its sense by transforming them into a gift for the slave. In following the biblical injunctions and preparing for worship, by placing a gift of freedom in the box, contributors become one of God's disciples a ray of his light. By displaying the power of benevolence, its ability to turn pennies into freedom, the box makes an accounting of its contributor's moral virtue and magnifies its meaningfulness. Moreover, as a parlor ornament, the box also reflects its contributor's refinement. Made for display, it serves as a sign of each contributor's gentility, as well as compassion. By packaging anti-slavery as not just a holy, but also a tasteful cause, the box produces sympathy for the slave as well as middle-class consciousness for its contributors. The alchemy of this artifact, its ability to materialize feeling, is further augmented by its companion track, the monthly offering. Edited by J.A. Collins, general agent of the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, and published monthly from July 1840 until October 1842, the monthly offering served as the weekly contributions plan official organ. Contributors were asked to buy the box as well as subscribe to the tract for 37 and a half cents a year. The synergy between the box and its companion text is evident in the tract's title, which transforms contributions into a religious offering and reinforces the plan's monthly collection schedule by its treasurers. The tract is also a visual replica of the box. It not only reduplicates the box's image on its cover, but also in framing that picture with an ornate border, it depicts itself as a box. If the depository is a tract, its companion tract is also a treasury, packed here with print rather than money. Moreover, its print calls its readers to fill their boxes. Designed to aid and encourage contributors in their work of love and mercy, the monthly offering works like the box to enlist sympathy for the cause by holding up to view the suffering and benighted slave and to remind contributors through its regular arrival to be punctual in their payments. Tales within the track, such as Maria Weston Chapman's Pinda, do both. Pinda, a fugitive slave, not only gains the reader's admiration for her loyal affection to her husband and industrious self-sufficiency once in freedom, but also models how to convert that sympathy into anti-slavery action. At the climax of the tale, just before Pinda, finally free, flees with her fugitive husband from Boston, she becomes a subscriber to the weekly contribution plan with such a large donation that the box must be opened since her dollar will not fit into its small slot. Rich in the possession of liberty, Pinda donates her savings to extend freedom to others with an effusion of heart so lovely and so rare. 
Like Pinda, contributors could express their feelings and perform their benevolence by giving money to the enslaved woman on the coin box. The monthly offering supplements the box in several key ways. As in Pinda's story, it reinforces the box's message that sympathy is most properly expressed through sense. Its regular monthly arrival prompts the collection of sense and aids their increase by producing more compassion for the enslaved. It also serves as a concrete emblem of what those scents are meant to fund, more print. The box and its track then enact the, scent, the circuit of sentiment, sense, and print that the anti-slavery movement more broadly propelled. Print creating sympathy, sympathy generating sense, and sense producing more print. The coin box offers a glimpse into institutional anti-slavery's larger workings, its modes of organizations, its production of novel media artifacts, and its creation of compelling cultural messages. It shows how word, image, and object work together in, anti -slavery in the anti-slavery argument and how the American Anti-Slavery Society materially enacted, not just espoused its message embodying its arguments within physical forms and modes of distribution that compounded their reach as well as their meaning. The dual sense of selling in my book's title, To Persuade as well as To Vend, captures how the movement's rhetorical approaches were consolidated and further circulated via its material practices. The box also shows how anti-slavery packaged its appeal as a cultural commodity to be displayed in the heart of the home, the parlor, and in so doing installed anti-slavery at the core of white Northern middle-class sensibility. The regional, racial, and class messages encoded, encoded in anti-slavery's artifacts were as much about producing white identity as black emancipation. Indeed, anti-slavery media created the narrative of white, of white selfhood grounded in black subjugation that remains with us today. Operating at the forefront of a new culture industry, anti-slavery succeeded not because it stood outside antebellum America's emerging middle-class culture, as, but as the box shows, because it compounded its growth. Thank you for your kind attention and I look forward to taking your comments and questions. So that was a that was a fascinating talk. Thank you. I have to I have to admit I had no idea of the the scale and the diversity of all of the different kinds of products and publications and the whole kind of infrastructure of abolitionist materials. And it I the the first first of all let me um, encourage those of you out in the out in the audience to use the Q and A function. Um, at the bottom of your little Zoom screen there to ask questions, or you can put them in the chat. Um, I can't see, <laughs> so if you raise your hand, I'm not going to be able to help. Um, but uh, so just use the Q and A. But I want to ask, in your in your research, I'm wondering what evidence there were for this kind of like for this for this kind of marketing and this this these this different products. I mean, were there churches that were doing similar kinds of fundraising? I mean, wh where did this come from? Um, in my book, I talk about sort of three forerunners. So there's the British anti-slavery movement, which also, I mean, U.S. was sort of just always lagging behind, you know, the British a bit. So, you know, if we think about the market really taking off in England in in the late 18th century that came a little bit later at, at, on the US side, the British anti-slavery movement was um, creating broadsides and um, material objects and of course, tons of print as well in order to, um, in, that, in that case, um, try to abolish the slave trade. So um, a lot of the techniques were brought over from British anti-slavery. Um, I would say the evangelical movement was another big driver. Many of um, the anti-slavery folks came from the tract society or uh, the broader evangelical movement. And um, as 
an array of great scholars have shown, um, you know, the way in which the Bible became, you know, the most mass mediated pro product of the 19th century, um, packaged in so many different ways. Um, um, so, um, bringing over what the evangelical movement was doing in the 1820s, kind of right into the anti-slavery movement in the 1830s, literally with some of the people who worked in that movement coming into anti-slavery. And the third, I would say is early black abolition, which was really very much on the cutting edge of a lot of this as well. Even though um, if you think about um, um, a lot of the early anti-slavery newspapers were African-American, Freedom's Journal, um, but also um, trying, not having the same access to this kind of media machine that um, predominantly white anti-slavery had, but still um, thinking through the ways in which to um, create a mass media message um, or very early on. So those are the three kind of um, precursors I look at in the book to the kind of emergence of the anti-slavery movement in the 18, 1830s. Um, but yeah, I would say the evangelical movement and the, to your point about churches um, was probably the most influential, um, at least on the US side. And did you find that there might be, you know, we were talking about this as an industry um, I mean, did, did you find that, th was there a criticism of the industry as one that was um, sort of generating money from, from abolition and from slavery for the enrichment of the people, you know, running it or, and were there, was there any sort of tension between black abolitionist movements and those abolitionist movements that were mostly white in this, re in this regard or other, I mean, obviously there's a lot of competition among yeah. the different abolitionist groups in many different ways. But, um, and a lot of that I'm sure must have been over this, you know, fighting for market share. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the amazing thing about the 1830s American Anti-Slavery Society was the way in which they fed everything into this centralized structure so that there wasn't this, yes, competition, but not everybody, it, it was like a well-oiled machine, everything working together, um, kind of the auxiliaries feeding information up to the center executive committee, them organizing, creating plans, feeding it back down and out um, so that each part really worked together in a, in a pretty well-regulated way. It didn't last for long because that form of centralization almost gave all the parts too much power in a way. Um, so it almost created its own dissolution in that way. Um, but um, I would say with the evangelical movement, there was a much, I, I, I've read much more about their kind of um, uncertainty and unhappiness about being in the market. Um, you know, was the market moral? Was it okay to be doing this, right? So there was much more angst about that within the evangelical movement. I didn't really see that much angst within the anti-slavery movement. Um, there was a sense that they were going to use the market to their moral purpose, and that was just fine. Um, and even when you get into the very murky um, ways in which they were actually creating a market for objects that had slaves on them <laughs> to create money by which to then free um, slaves. And that logic is so convoluted and, and troubling. They didn't even seem to, as long as they weren't literally buying slaves, which they as an organization um, said that they would not do because they didn't want to participate in the slave market. This market they were creating at fairs, for instance, that you know pretty much was sort of a slave market of sorts. Um, they, they didn't seem to um, worry about or register that kind of contradiction. It was, it's really interesting given how yeah. I mean, they I was replicate thinking, the very thing they're trying to interrupt. Yeah, I mean, and, and another layer it was, I, I was thinking about the, the sugar bowl you were showing and you know, how much sugar would have been produced through or with slave labor, you know, even like, which would have been more, I guess, more of an 18th century issue, but like the, but just to think about sugar as a product that often is associated as a product of slavery and of slave plantations sort of adds another like, right. <laughs> um, yes. Another layer onto that. Yes. That's why I say a lot of it in, in, um, 
in unpacking what all of these strange objects kind of mean, I came to realize it's really about creating white identity. Um, and black emancipation is a kind of conduit towards that. Um, that if you, again, if you look at the box of that circuit, it's such a kind of closed circuit, right? It's like, what's really getting produced here? Um, except, you know, feeling that becomes sense, it becomes print, it becomes feeling, you know, like, so it's producing, it's, it's gotta be producing something for the consumer um, in that circuit, right? Um, even right. if eventually that circuit's supposed to somehow break open and, and magically free the slave. And, um, and of course it did in a very complex way in terms of how culture operates, but um, it, it did become pretty clear to me as I started to unpack these things, wait a second, this is a lot more just than about black emancipation. Yeah, I mean, what struck me about the collection box was, a, was that kind of uncanny sense of, you know, as a kid, you know, people still are giving out these kinds of collection boxes. They're still a, a pretty common tool. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in my church growing up, we had this thing that was like called a rice bowl. And I think it was a fundraiser for UNICEF, maybe, yeah, or it may have been a more sort of Catholic phrase thing. And, and, you know, from what you're saying, like there's a way in which this operates independently from any actual benefit that's realized by the person whose picture is on the rice bowl or on the, on the box, you know, that it's, um, and, and it's, so it's, um, it, it is a, it, it is a, a kind of a thought exercise, you know, it's, it's very complicated. Yeah. Um, but I was just struck by the familiarity of that object, you know, yes. and, and, and how, you know, how much that is still something that's still a technique we use. Yeah. I mean, I think the UNICEF box actually will be going around this weekend, right? It's, it's often used at Halloween where Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like with the UNICEF box at Halloween, um, which is again an odd combination too. Yeah, and that's what sort of got me thinking about what's the gender. You know, I guess that's somebody's dissertation somewhere is like the history of those. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> those boxes. Um, I, I want to encourage the the folks in our audience tonight if they have questions to put them into the Q and A. Um. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, just type them in or you know put something in the comment. Again, we um, I put into the chat while Professor Gaudu was talking a link to the Pen Press site that has her book on it as well as the discount code um, that if you wanted to go out and buy it tonight, it would give you a nice discount on the purchase of of that. Um, one other thing too was just thinking about like these ephemeral materials, you know, and how um, I, I, I had a this sort of personal question about like, do you collect this? I mean, I imagine this stuff is not easy or cheap to collect, and it probably is very rare. You know, the those collection boxes or the pot holders or whatever. I mean, I'm sure most of those are long, long gone. Mm -hmm. But are there particular collections where that where there's a lot of that ephemera? Um, that was the hardest to find. Um, you know, the print, you know, was published in large volumes and, you know, I can find in the anti-slavery almanac at the Vanderbilt, you know, um, special collections. Um, and even the broadsides um, and visual objects, um, I found more easily. Um, so, you know, part of what I did was go through the catalog and just try to find everything in it and make sure um, I mean, in that sense, there was a nice accounting for me of what had been produced. Um, and I didn't find everything, but I found a lot of the prints, but the prints and et cetera, the et cetera is all that material culture that really never gets cataloged um, and also never really gets saved because they're considered tchotchkes or whatever. So um, really the ways in which I found the material objects were that there are copious reports of the anti-slavery fairs in which the um, women managers would make detailed accountings of everything that was sent to the fair, partially as a way to kind of thank, thank the people that sent it, like, and the lovely women from Great Britain sent, you know, 
um, seaweed volumes or, you know, um, and they were very precise, both in trying to make an accounting for as a kind of thank you, but also as a kind of promotion and branding too. like, look at all this abundance we had at our fair. Um, so through the print kind of reports of the fairs, I was able to find a lot, you know, learn about um, a large range of objects, even if I wasn't able to actually see them. And mostly the material objects are, you know, winter tour, um, the Swarthmore Library has a bunch of really um, great material artifacts. Um, just here, there, everywhere, um, bits and pieces, but largely really through the print record is how that material ephemera has been um, kind of retained. Um, I'll look forward to um, spending more time with your book. I, I have a bunch of other questions that all start to tail into um, early philanthropy, women in philanthropy, some of the work that um, our own Connie King has gotten into um, over the years. Um, the way in which so much of this work that you're talking about seems so clearly gendered and is about women and women's ability to dispose of some small amounts of money or the ways in which that kind of parallel economy would have would have worked. Um, and I, I think that's perhaps uh, I have some homework to do to learn more about that, <laughs> but I look forward to, to doing that. Um, our audience is quiet this evening. Um, been a long I think day. <laughs> it is a long day, as you've said, and uh, it's a school night. Um, so just let me thank you again, Professor Gaudu. Thank you for a really fascinating talk. Um, and uh, I, I also just want to acknowledge and, and thank you for what you said at the beginning of your talk about your time at the library company. Um, you know, when I when I started at the library company, I talked to a lot of fellows and um, a lot of professors and scholars, and I asked them, you know, what does the library company do really well? Like, what's the one thing we do that makes us different? And the answer I got from almost everybody um, was you serve scholars really well. And people have stories very much like yours. And that's something that as um, in my time there that we've really worked to preserve um, and have really tried to make a priority, especially during COVID, and thinking about how can we continue to serve scholars the way that we do, and also how can we serve scholars in a in a changing world of the academic humanities? You know, what does it mean to serve scholars when they're, especially younger ones, are entering such a horrible job market? Um, that's another talk for another time. But I just wanted to thank you for those comments. It's oh. it's um, it is it's nice to hear, and um, we're really glad to have you back. Yeah. I'm so glad to um, to have made the full circle. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. Well, thank you all. Um, please return to our uh, website for upcoming events. Um, we will have another fireside chat coming up next week. I put some of the information for that just in the chat right now, or a minute or a moment ago. Um, the lost tradition of economic equality in America with Daniel Mendel. Uh, anyway, thank you again. Um, have a good evening. Thank you again, Professor Gaudu, and I hope we see you back at the library company sometime soon. Thank you so much. Good night.